Hi, my name is Dr. Richard Bernstein. Uh, I am a type 1 diabetic. I've had diabetes uh, since the age of 11. I'm uh, shortly going to be 85 years of age. I've been treating other diabetics since 1983. Uh, I uh, started practicing at the age of 49. Uh, I invented blood sugar self-monitoring and basal bolus insulin dosing. I also invented a number of uh, non-common treatments for type 2 diabetes. Um, I'm here today to answer some of your questions. Uh, the first question is, what is the cause of diabetic complications? Simple answer, elevated blood sugars. A secondary answer is that some studies have shown that wide swings in blood sugars can also be a cause of diabetic complications. There have over the years been a number of so-called authorities, including uh, organizations claiming that the complications of diabetes are caused by the disease diabetes and are unrelated to blood sugar. This is false, uh, and it's been pro promoted mostly because many physicians do not know how to keep blood sugars normal. Um, that's basically it. Uh, I'll add one more thing. Elevated blood sugars can affect almost every tissue in the body. Um, eyes, nerves, kidneys, skin, um, uh, liver, uh, you name it, it, it pr can probably adversely affected, be adversely affected by high blood sugars. Uh, there are some, there are many mechanisms by which elevated blood sugars can cause the complications of diabetes. Um, some of these mechanisms have been intensively studied and others uh, less intensively. For example, um, there are tissues in the body uh, called aldose reductase producers. Uh, they produce an enzyme in the presence of high blood sugars that converts glucose to sorbitol. Uh, sorbitol is an osmotic agent that attracts water. So if there's a lot of sorbitol in a cell, water will be attracted to the cell and the cell will swell up. It, its functions will be impaired and it can eventually blow up, explode from being so uh, swollen with water. Uh, the aldose reductase tissues include the lens of the eye, can get cataracts, uh, nerves throughout the body, and we've heard of neuropathies, damage to nerves, uh, the Schwann cells, which are cells that insulate axons that come out of nerves, the long spidery arms that come out of nerves called axons, and they are, uh, let's call it electrically insulated with cells called Schwann cells. These are all those reductase shells. Uh, cells. Um, cells in the kidney called mesangial cells, likewise, are all those reductase cells. Cells that line the outside of capillaries, uh, little blood capillaries. <coughs> uh, these are all those reductase cells. Um, there's another common cause of uh, diabetic complications. These are called advanced glycation end products. This is where glucose sticks to proteins in a cell and cause the proteins to uh, either lose their function or uh, do things that are inappropriate. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the connective tissue uh, adjacent to our joints um, uh, connected to muscles and bones. Connective tissue is high in a protein called collagen. Collagen is probably the most longest lived
protein in the human body. Uh, in a young, healthy person, uh, its turnover, its half-life is about 15 years. In older or poorly controlled diabetic people, the collagen may be around much longer. And collagen gets glycated. That is, glucose sticks to the proteins and uh, to the amino acids in the collagen. And when the fibers of collagen uh, have glucose stuck to them, they get glued together by the glucose and no longer function smoothly. So you try to move a joint where all the connective tissue near the joint, frequently the shoulder, uh, is glycated, you will tear the fibers and you might have pain, limited range of motion in the shoulder, etc. Uh, in a young, healthy person, uh, its turnover, its half-life is about 15 years. In older or poorly controlled diabetic people, the collagen may be around much longer. And collagen gets glycated. That is, glucose sticks to the proteins and uh, to the amino acids in the collagen. And when the fibers of collagen uh, have glucose stuck to them, they get glued together by the glucose and no longer function smoothly. So you try to move a joint where all the connective tissue near the joint, frequently the shoulder, uh, is glycated, you will tear the fibers and you might have pain, limited range of motion in the shoulder, etc. This is also a cause of carpal tunnel syndrome, um, which is weakness in the wrist and uh, pain uh, on performing functions that involve the wrist. Uh, there's Dupuytren's contracture, which is a flexing of the fingers caused by glycation of collagen in the tendons that flex the fingers. Um, uh, there's another ailment that you could look up in, on the internet called Peroni's disease that, according to the newspapers, uh, affected one of our presidents. Um, so there are many biochemical reasons why glucose is uh, destructive and causes many problems. Uh, it causes heart disease, uh, and I said kidney failure before. So that's sort of a summary, uh, a long answer to a short question. What are some common diabetic complications? Well, I already mentioned a few of them, but I'll give you uh, examples of some others. Let's take blindness. Blindness most commonly occurs in diabetics either by macular edema, which is uh, the outflow of fluid from the blood vessels near the center of the eye. The center of the eye has uh, is where we concentrate when we're reading, uh, looking at an object. Uh, the macula uh, can be damaged by leakage of proteins from the bloodstream into the macula, uh, damaging the cells in the macula. So macular edema is one cause of diabetic complications. And I might add that I have seen patients with macular edema who had uh, chronically elevated blood sugars. And when we normalize their blood sugars uh, for many months, the macular edema reverses. And when retinologists, which are doctors who, ophthalmologists who treat the retina, when they see these cases, they can't believe it because in their experience, Macular edema doesn't reverse, but in my experience, it does. Um, an, another cause of blindness is proliferative retinopathy. This involves a uh, proliferation of microscopic capillaries or blood vessels in the retina. Uh, might be in the central of vi uh, center of vision might be out in the periphery, could be anywhere in the retina. And these blood vessels that proliferate uh, are fragile. They uh, can be easily broken. Um, 
and uh, the one of the mechanisms that causes uh, these pro these proliferative vessels involves uh, actually aldose reductase cells. These cells that line the outside of these tiny capillaries act as an exoskeleton, outside skeleton, uh, are called pericytes. The pericytes, when exposed to glucose, will absorb, will rapidly absorb the glucose from the bloodstream. Um, one characteristic of uh, aldose reductase cells is that they do not require insulin for the entry of glucose. So these are the first cells to be bombarded with glucose when blood sugars are elevated. So here we have these pericytes getting loaded with glucose and eventually bursting. The pericytes will rapidly expand due to the inflow of water. First glucose comes in, gets converted to sorbitol, that causes an inflow of water, pericyte bursts, and uh, here's the pericyte. Let's say my finger is a capillary. Here are the pericytes all around the surface of the capillary. One of them bursts. The endothelial cell underneath it will balloon out. It'll look like a little bubble. And under uh, a, micro, a, a magnifying ophthalmoscope, they're called microaneurysms. It's a little bubble of the blood vessel called an aneurysm. And that bubble can burst and cause blood to be released into the retina. And even more important, the pericytes produce an anti-proliferation factor, a factor that prevents proliferative retinopathy. But when you lose pericytes, they can, there's no longer a pericyte to make that factor that area will allow the proliferation of capillaries and you now get proliferative retinopathy. So you can get problem from these proliferative cells, uh, proliferative vessels that can burst, or you can uh, also get rat retinopathy from the bursting of the microaneurysms. I think that the microaneurysms are more of a warning sign uh, but the proliferation is a much more serious condition. Um, there, uh, I mentioned the first frozen shoulder. We have something called iliotibial band tensor fascia lata syndrome. Uh, the iliotibial band is a uh, ba band of fibrous connect connective tissue that goes from the hip uh, down the outside of the leg and it connects to another band of tissue that gets all the way to the knee from uh, halfway up the thigh down to the knee called the iliotibial band. And the, the collagen fibers in, the, in this structure can get glycated, ca causing pain, cause, can even cripple people so that they cannot walk. Um, that reminds me of another complication called Charcot foot. Uh, where uh, there's loss of pain sensation in the feet uh, and loss of proprioception, which is the ability to sense the position of the joint or the position of the foot. And uh, these people who can't feel their feet smash their feet against the ground when they take steps. And uh, the high blood sugars also cause bone loss so you have bone thinning in the feet uh, combined with banging the feet repeatedly and the feet end up looking like a bag of bones. Uh, a very, uh, it could be very painful, uh, although if you have severe neuropathy, you might not feel it. Uh, that is not reversible because uh, the, the bones are already fractured into little pieces. Um, There are infections. Uh, elevated blood sugars 
foster the growth of bacteria. So you can have all kinds of infections, uh, common ones and uncommon ones. They can, they're usually bacterial, but they can also be viral. Very common are infections in the mouth, such as um, uh, gum infections, uh, nerve root infections. Uh, in fact, the great bulk of long-term diabetics uh, will have uh, uh, procedures on their teeth where the uh, endodontist uh, destroys a nerve root in a tooth. Uh, these people with the endodontal infections uh, also develop infection of the jawbone adjacent to the tooth called osteomyelitis. Uh, osteomyelitis reminds me of infections that uh, diabetics frequently have in the feet where um, uh, a podiatrist or a family member will try to remove a callus. They may buy one of these um, little machines that the ADA advertises in um, their magazines for patients, little machine to grind down calluses, or they'll use a pumice stone to grind down a callus. And uh, you grind down enough calluses, eventually you'll get one that ground down too far, the skin will get infected, and uh, eventually it'll go, uh, spread to the bone. And we have in the USA uh, 500,000 known amputations a year due to these infections. They're usually called salami surgery, where um, uh, first a toe is amputated, but that doesn't stop the spread of the infection. Then the forefoot is amputated, then the whole foot is amputated, then uh, there may be a below the knee amputation and then above the knee amputation. Usually by the time they get to the above the knee amputation, the infection is gone. Um, I could probably go for hours. Uh, there are just so many uh, complications of diabetes, and they're all caused by elevated blood sugars. And in most of the cases, uh, the underlying mechanism is understood. Okay. Now, for many years, uh, it was claimed that children do not get diabetic complications. But I have to perform a thorough exam on every new patient to my office. I just examined a young lady uh, yet two days ago, and she had about 15 different diabetic complications. Um, she had lost uh, a reflex in her eyes called hippus. She had double vision in one direction of these. Uh, the longer term diabetics, she, she was only diagnosed uh, two months ago. Uh, so this is a brand new diabetic. But her blood sugars were probably elevated uh, for a few years before the diagnosis. Uh, she, they weren't as high, high enough to cause the ketoacidosis that she had, but uh, they were high enough to slowly cause complications. Um, so she had uh, um, uh, another complication called Munkeberg's atherosclerosis. I won't go into the details, it's sort of complicated. Um, and as I said, she had about 15 different complications. The, as, a, as I was about to say, the people who've had diabetes for a longer period of time usually have double vision in multiple directions of gaze, sometimes in all nine directions that I test. Now, they don't know it until I test them because I put uh, a red glass over one eye and clear glass over the other eye and shine a light, and, what, and they're able to uh, distinguish the two lights. They look separate. Uh, you see a separate red and white light, uh, and when they report that, we know they have double vision. Um, 
so uh, it would, as I said, it would take me hours to list uh, all of the ones that I see. What is your experience treating and having diabetic, diabetic complications? Well, I had um, diabetic kidney disease uh, where every time I tested my urine uh, for uh, protein, in those days, uh, uh, I would use a dipstick. I had read, this was before I became a physician, I read that uh, a sign of kidney disease is protein in the urine. And I would get a dipstick for protein, and every time I peed on it, it would turn the darkest color. Uh, it was, a, I believe, a dark green that looked like black. Um, and I s subsequently, years later, read that if you have what we called four plus proteinuria um, every time you urinate, you're producing at least 1,500 milligrams of protein in your urine per day. And normal is, depending upon what authority you consult, is usually under 300 milligrams. So I had five times the high end of normal. Uh, and that totally reversed after uh, a number of years of normal blood sugars. Um, and normal, by the way, for an adult is around 83 milligrams per deciliter. And for kids, um, let's say, uh, under 16, 17 years of age, uh, normal is around 65, 70, or 75 milligrams per deciliter. The younger ones tend to have, non-diabetics tend to have lower blood sugars. Um, I also had severe gastroparesis, which is a failure of the stomach to empty predictably. I had burning, bloating, burning, belching after meals. Um, and I would have constant burning almost all day long. And I would uh, be consuming uh, two bottles of Rolaid, which is calcium carbonate, an antacid. I'd, I'd consult two, two uh, bottles of Rolaid a week. That's about 200 tablets a week. And um, uh, they didn't do a hell of a lot of good. And it took 13 years of normal blood sugars before I had the last of my burning attacks. Um, the gastroparesis also makes it very hard to keep blood sugars normal. How I managed to do that, uh, I just don't know. Uh, I did develop a night blindness very early on. I guess uh, when I was about 25, maybe earlier, and that has not cleared up. Uh, I don't know why. I don't have proliferative retinopathy. I don't have uh, diabetic macular uh, edema, uh, but I still have my night blindness. Um, I have this very interesting condition called Munkeberg's, I had this, Munkeberg's atherosclerosis. I was tested for it um, in 1983, when I first got out of medical school, and uh, it was we tested with something called an oscillometer. Uh, I also had x-rays of my ankles that showed calcified arteries in the ankles, which is a sign of this Munkeberg's atherosclerosis. And uh, I was tested by a very famous doctor who was at that time the world's authority on the diabetic foot. And I ended up working in his clinic so I'd learn how to tr treat diabetic foot ulcers. And I ended up becoming the director of the clinic. I worked in the clinic for 29 years. And um, he told me that this is not reversible. Well, why did he tell me that? Because he had never seen a diabetic with normal blood sugars. Now, I had already had normal blood sugars, uh, let's say, for about 
uh, 10 or 12 years by the time he saw me, but it was still very abnormal. About 20 years later, I was teaching the residents in my clinic about this condition. And I said, um, well, we were out of patients. And most of the patients in the foot care clinic are diabetics. They're the ones with foot problems. And we were we had no patients. So I'm teaching the residents. I said, okay, I'll show you a good example of Munkerberg's atherosclerosis. And I taught them how to make oscillometric measurements of my uh, lower extremities. And lo, lo and behold, all of the measurements were absolutely normal. So apparently this condition is reversible. I didn't realize it. I've seen it reverse in a few other patients, but it takes a long, long time uh, to reverse it. I never reported it in the scientific literature for two reasons. One, it was hard for me to get published in the diabetes journals because uh, I was considered an enemy by virtue of my insistence upon normal blood sugars. Uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to papers in the field of medicine, you usually need such things as large scale double blind studies. And a report on one case is rarely published. It's interesting that in psychiatry, uh, single case reports are frequently published, but a, a report, especially a report about the author, doesn't stand a chance of getting published. So I've never published this. Um, but when I lecture, I do talk about it. Uh, did I have any other complications that I can think of? Um, I did have an early diagnosis of uh, a cardiac disease, but uh, about five years ago, I got tested for what's called the coronary artery calcium score, which measures the amount of plaque in uh, coronary arteries. And normal is uh, zero, having absolutely no plaque. And the score goes up to, let's say, 15,000, where a computer can count 15,000 pieces of plaque. I had a score of one after, uh, I guess it was maybe 65 years with diabetes. Uh, maybe it was 70 years. Um, so uh, whatever coronary artery disease I had when, my, when I was young, apparently reversed. Um, let's see what other questions we have. Oh, I did not answer the question about treating other people's complications. Um, I'll give you some examples. Uh, painful neuropathy in the feet. That usually gets better uh, over the course of a few months. Doesn't totally get better in a few months, but improves. And it takes years for it to fully get better. When we have numb feet, uh, what we see initially with normal blood sugars after a few months is renewed sensitivity to pain. Where the foot previously felt nothing, it now feels pain and uh, from the re-sprouting of nerves. And that can be very severe pain, but patients usually can tolerate it because they know that a few more months of normal blood sugars the severe pain will go away. And that's the sort of thing that we see. Um, there's erectile dysfunction, which you constantly hear about on television called the ED, and that's a neuropathy. And um, sometimes it's so far advanced that uh, I've not seen it reverse. But with other people who say, uh, uh, I still have penile erections, but they don't last long enough for action. Uh, again, after a few months, 
they start lasting long enough. But it takes, again, years for total recovery. Um, when I test someone uh, for uh, double vision, I find, let's say that a new patient, uh, new to me, but long-term diabetic, has double vision in all nine directions of gaze that I test. Uh, comes back in two years with normal blood sugars for two years, he might have double vision in seven directions. Another two years, he might only have double vision in five directions. Eventually, the double vision will vanish altogether. Um, I've seen uh, people with micro microaneurysms that disappeared over time. I've seen people with early proliferative retinopathy that disappeared over time. Um, uh, severe proliferative retinopathy probably gets treated so that you don't get a chance to see it <clears throat> disappear on your, your on its own unless you uh, prevent uh, the treatments that are, are being rendered. And uh, nowadays, you don't always need laser treatments. There are some other treatments that are more benign that can uh, sometimes restore vision rapidly. Um, I'm trying to think what other things I've seen in patients. Um, ah, yes, there's the RR interval study, which is a study of the autonomic nervous system that I do on every new patient, and then I try to re repeat it on patients after uh, uh, every year, year and a half. And uh, it involves the use of the electrocardiograph machine and deep breathing while you're looking at um, intervals between heartbeats. And uh, this thing is frequently abnormal uh, in people uh, with long-term diabetes. And uh, it's not just a sign of uh, a cardiac abnormality. Uh, autonomic neuropathy can cause gastroparesis, and that's what we're mostly worried about. So we actually have seen the RR study improve, and we've seen uh, gastroparesis reverse over many years. So uh, if I rack my brain, I could probably think of other complications that were reversed, but most of the complications reversed. Uh, things like that involve the glycation of collagen, uh, like Dupuytren's contracture, um, frozen shoulders, uh, iliotibial band tensor lattice syndrome, um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, these things don't reverse on their own. They require treatment. Uh, the treatment uh, is variable. For example, for frozen shoulder, sometimes trigger point massage by a physiotherapist uh, can do the job, but has to be repeated uh, every couple of weeks for maybe a year or two. Um, Iliotibial band tensor partial lattice syndrome uh, responds to what's called vacuum stretching uh, over the length of this structure. Um, uh, Dupuytren's contracture uh, responds to a little invention of mine, uh, which is the mixture of collagenase, an enzyme that dissolves collagen with a solvent called DMSO. And um, we have uh, maybe a six to one ratio of DMSO, the collagen, collagenase, and you apply it, you have the patient apply it uh, maybe with um, a little um, applicator glass to the um, uh, Dupuytren's, uh, to the swollen tendon, and that goes down over a period of a year or two. Uh, there are doctors who inject collagenase into the Dupuytren's, but the procedure is uh, very costly, frequently has to be repeated, and 
uh, the doctors usually don't guarantee their work because it's it's uncertain. Likewise, the application of the collagenase and DMSO, uh, I haven't done it that often that I can guarantee it, but um, uh, what I did do, for example, uh, people frequently have this on both hands. So I'll treat the more severe hand. Like I had a friend who had a lump on the flexor tendon of his fourth finger that was the size of a walnut. And he had one on the other hand that was half the size. So I had him apply, apply it only to the walnut-sized one for a year, and it came down to be smaller than the other one. And uh, he got tired of doing it and let it stay after it got down to a smaller size. But um, I would imagine that it would have disappeared altogether. And I've done this for other people also. Um, I guess that's all the special reversals of complications that I'd like to talk to talk about right now. Uh, is there a way to entirely avoid diabetes complications? Yeah, normal blood sugars. I I guarantee it. Uh, now, it. There is a question about who says normal, the scientific studies or endocrinologists who don't know how to achieve normal blood sugars and say that high blood sugars are normal. Um, also, there are certain associations like the American Diabetes Association and probably some foreign associations that pick high numbers for hemoglobin A1C and call them normal. So the ADA, I think, says uh, an A1C of 6.5 is normal. Well, that's an average blood sugar of about 160 milligrams per deciliter, which is about double normal for an adult and more than double normal for a child. So um, uh, I'm talking about real normal, not about uh, these fanciful normal. What A1C is good enough? Well, I just answered it. Um, and I, well, and I, I did not answer it, I'm sorry. Uh, and A1C, I would speculate between 5.2, between 4.2 and 4.6 is probably what you will see in a non-diabetic who's not obese, uh, does not have a family history of diabetes, and uh, is not overeating sweets as many people are doing today. And by sweets, I include um, uh, grains. So uh, whole grain bread uh, is going to raise blood sugar, is going to raise A1C. And I wouldn't expect someone who eats several uh, slices of whole grain bread a day to uh, have an A1C of 4.2 to 4.6. What do you say to someone who says no risk at 6.5 or less? Well, that's the American Diabetes Association. And of course, I see and all doctors see uh, diabetic complications in people with A1Cs under 6.5, but not under 5. Um, now, of course, it's true that most doctors do not really examine their patients. Uh, they may not even uh, check the blood pressure. They'll have someone check a patient's blood pressure, and um, uh, they won't do any other uh, part of the physical exam. My physical exam for diabetes, which is separate from my general physical exam, all done in this, although done in the same day, the diabetes exam is eight pages long and takes me about four hours to perform. So uh, uh, there are very few doctors who actually uh, have seen the complications of diabetes firsthand, unless they're looking at gross ones like amputations or a patient who uh, says he's blind. They don't look in the eyes necessarily to, to, to see what's in there, but 
the patient says he's blind, they've seen a blind uh, complication. Um, so uh, uh, I had a doctor in uh, my office yesterday who was um, in as an observer and she saw all the tests that I did on a new patient and she saw all the complications I found and she said, I didn't know any of these complications, most of these complications existed. Can most diabetes complications be reversed? Which cannot in your experience? Well, I just answered that. Uh, those that involve glycation of collagen require treatment. Now, collagen has a half-life in a healthy person, non-diabetic, of 15 years. Uh, so in five half-lives, there's no more collagen left. So if you could keep someone's blood sugar normal for 75 years, and if he lives that long, uh, there won't be any more glycated collagen. My, that's my guess. Uh, so his carpal tunnel syndrome might get better, and his uh, uh, dupuytren's contracture and frozen shoulder might all get better. Um, uh, if he survives 75 years of normal blood sugars. When someone has endured decades of hyperglycemia, that's high blood sugars, should they hope that normalizing the blood sugar can still make a difference or is it too late? Well, if they're totally blind, it's too late. If um, their kidney function is uh, as, as estimated by creatinine clearment, clearance or glomerular filtration rate, which is the rate at which uh, kidneys perform their job. If the GFR, let's say, is under 10, uh, the uh, kidney destruction proceeds on its own. You're overworking the kidney and it's going to self-destruct. Um, there are there have been articles that claim that under 30, it will self-destruct. I've seen people with GFRs of 30 where we keep their blood sugar normal for years and they last for a long time. Their GFR slowly comes down. Uh, so I have um, a patient who uh, I believe saw me initially with a GFR of 30 uh, about 20 years ago, and I think his GFR is around 20 right now. So if you have normal blood sugars, there's a good chance that you could slow down even advanced kidney disease. When it gets down uh, below 15, it's a big question mark how long uh, you can keep the kidneys alive. Below 10 is worse than below 15, and below 5 is worse than below 10. Um, now, there are a number of the, the neurologic complications uh, after many years of diabetes, uh, of uncontrolled or high blood sugar diabetes. Uh, still can be reversed because I've seen it. Um, uh, I've seen many people with great pain in their feet where that reverses, where with numbness in the feet is very common. I've seen that reverse. So certain of the complications, usually the neurologic ones, uh, reverse. Uh, other complications don't reverse. For example, there's a complication that I have, which you could look up on the internet. It's called the intrinsic minus, minus foot. Intrinsic minus. Uh, that's a foot deformity that's common to diabetes with hammer toes or so-called claw foot. Um, and uh, this does not reverse. Um, people have asked me, is there an exercise that you could do to reverse it? Well, uh, due to the lack of 
motor innervation in these toes, you can't straighten them out. So uh, there's no exercise that you do to straighten out these um, deformed toes. And it, uh, it also it involves the shape of the whole foot. The forefoot rotates relative to the hind foot. There are prominent metatarsal heads, many features that increase the likelihood of um, too much pressure at certain sites, tempting uh, podiatrists to file down calluses, uh, thereby causing amputa uh, infections and amputations. Um, I have intrinsic minus foot, uh, milder than many, more severe than a uh, uh, few of the patients who come in here, and that is not going to reverse. Uh, so I have slightly hammer toes, and I have a uh, channel between the metatarsal bones on the top of my foot uh, where uh, muscles have wasted. Has the rate of diabetes complications in people with type 1 diabetes improved in recent times? Has technology helped people avoid complications? I doubt it. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, some years we get um, uh, notifications in the literature that amputations are, are down a little. Some years we get notification that they're up a little. Whether there's uh, any information on other complications, I don't know. Um, I, I suspect that uh, since the advent of blood sugar self-monitoring and basal bolus insulin dosing, both of which I introduced, uh, I suspect that there are uh, that the range of high, that the range of blood sugars is narrower than it used to be, because people can correct a blood sugar of 400 and bring it down to 200. So um, uh, back in the old days, when I first started measuring my own blood sugars, uh, in a typical day, my blood sugar would go from 40 to 600. In those days, it was possible to measure high blood sugars directly. Um, and uh, that's the way it was going for everyone before we had self-monitoring. So I think there's been an improvement since then. Uh, by the way, when it comes to type 1 diabetics, there are some new things that we're seeing. We're seeing obesity or type 2 diabetes caused by obesity in type 1 diabetics caused by the a common prescription of high carbohydrate diets and very high doses of insulin uh, for type 1 diabetics. This is uh, like universal in the USA. Uh, it's common in Australia. And um, uh, I'm not sure of the situation in European countries, uh, but here we're now making, uh, turning little kids into fatties and uh, giving them uh, type 2 diabetes. Another thing that's sort of new is that there have been many studies of the brains of growing diabetic children. And all of these children that are studied have elevated blood sugars. Um, and uh, brain development is significantly impaired in, di in kids with high blood sugars. Um, uh, cognition is impaired, and other functions are impaired. Um, uh, in adults, uh, there's likewise impairment of short-term memory um, and uh, impairment in cognition, uh, even impairment in motor function uh, due to damage to the brain from high blood sugars. Um, next question. Recently, research has shown that depression in people with diabetes may be due in part to physical changes in the brain and not just related to the strain of living with a chronic condition. What do you think about this? Well, 
it may well be the case. Uh, I don't know that it's been demonstrated, but I did a study of depression and diabetes at, in two places, at the Rockefeller, University, Rockefeller Institute in those days. Now it's Rockefeller University. Um, this was before I went to medical school. When I discovered how to normalize blood sugar, it happened that Rockefeller University uh, was one of the few institutions measuring hemoglobin A1C. So I said to myself, hey, this is a way to see if we improve blood sugars. Um, uh, I'll see if I can get them to use my method to normalize blood sugars and attempt to normalize diabetic complications. So we picked complications that were early, like uh, leakage of protein into the vitreous humor in the eye and a few other early complications. Um, and we were able to reverse them all. Um, but we had to recruit the patients from somewhere and I, strangely enough, was one of two non-physician members of the Board of Trustees of the New York chapter of the American Diabetes Association. So I knew the handful of diabetes specialists that we had uh, back in those days, which was around 19, let's say 1970. Um, and I asked the doctors to give us their worst patients, the ones that, that they couldn't stand, uh, that were uncooperative, that had bad complications, uh, uh, et cetera. <laughs> and uh, to me, they were very nice people, but um, we, uh, tr I, I trained them in what to do. And a doctor at Rockefeller adjusted their insulin doses. We put them on very low carbohydrate diets, but the doctors who uh, gave me the patients said, you're gonna make them crazy. They were glad to get rid of these patients, but they said such compulsive behavior is gonna make them crazy. So I knew that I felt much relieved after I got my blood sugar straightened out uh, there was no longer a sword hanging over my head. So I, I found a type 2 diabetic um, uh, psychiatrist who was the office partner of my wife, who was a psychiatrist. And uh, he examined each of the patients throughout the training program, before the training and at the tail end. And he administered... Uh, a test called the Hamilton Depression Score, which is still used today. Uh, and uh, severe depression was above uh, a score of 20. Um, depression was over, mild depression was over a score of six. And uh, these people were all over 20 at the, on the, at the initial test. And after they got their blood sugars controlled, all but one lady uh, came under six, that is not depressed, uh, and she never adhered to the diet or really participated the way she was supposed to. Um, so uh, we could say that, and she did not normalize her blood sugars. So if we got the blood sugars normalized, the depression went away and I don't think it's from the normal blood sugars. I think it's from the removal of a threat to your life, a, a daily threat. Just remember, these people never knew what their blood sugars were, except once a month when they went to the doctor's office and he checked their blood sugar. Uh, we repeated the same study at Downstate University uh, in Brooklyn, which was also measuring hemoglobin A1C. And um, it was actually at Downstate that we did the study with the leakage of protein into the vitreous humor. 
and we again got reversal of other complications. And uh, here we had a psychologist uh, administering the Hamilton depression score with similar results. Developing diabetes complications can bring great emotional stress and frustration. How did you manage to channel your energy and focus into learning how to exactly manage your blood sugar levels in the midst of complications? Well, the only disturbing, really uh, interfering complication that I had was the constant pain from gastroparesis. And the method that I developed for normalizing my blood sugars was very simple and straightforward and obvious. Uh, I was an engineer, and it happens that my specialty was systems engineering. Uh, I don't know that they had that term in those days, but that's what I had uh, spent my uh, uh, professional career doing. So I knew how to work, work out a system that would do something. And um, I was able to accomplish this very rapidly. Um, why did I do it? Uh, against all obstacles. The only obstacles were that um, uh, my wife thought that was a physician thought that I'd get infections from sticking my fingers. Um, and she didn't like me sticking them. But um, it, it, I, I was frightened. I knew that I was uh, doomed to have a very short life and doomed to have a, a painful life um, and uh, many disabilities, um, I was desperate to uh, get out of this bind easy enough. And since I had the uh, know-how to um, uh, work on systems, that was the thing to do. And I was able to do it pretty rapidly. 